All right. So again, good morning. You're joining IANTA's webinar series, Supporting Public Arts. Indigenous artists share their vision. Goati kaitawa haupa, shinome kutu tuwitsa, kohaya hano, ash rashka washti. Greetings. My name is Bianca Mitchell. I am from the Pueblo of Akma, and I am the education manager for IANTA. And just to give you a little bit of information on IANTA, uh, for nearly two decades, IANTA has served as a national voice for the American Indian nations engaged in cultural tourism. In addition to serving as a voice for Indian country tourism, IANTA provides technical assistance and training to tribal nations and native owned enterprises engaged in tourism, hospitality and recreation. As IANTA's mission is to introduce to define, introduce, grow, and sustain American Indian, Alaska Native, and Native Hawaiian tourism that honors traditions and values. In addition to these webinars like this, um, in partnership with the George Washington University International Institute of Tourism Studies, IANTA presents an online cultural heritage certificate program designed to help tourism professionals and tribal planners hone in their cultural tourism skills. Some of you uh, participating in this webinar might be uh, registered for that course, which began yesterday and will end on February 28th. Uh, please check back with us. If you haven't signed up for our newsletter, do so and join us for our next cohort in 2022. Um, again, this is the Cultural Heritage Certificate Program. Um, as far as um, the educational op opportunities, we also offer the annual Indian Tourism Conference, American Indian Tourism Conference or AITC. Uh, the 2021 AITC event will be held in Fort McDowell, Arizona at the Wicopa Casino Resort on October 25th and 28th. Again, please sign up for our newsletter and you can receive that information directly. And at this time, Again, thank you for joining our webinar. Um, Native arts are integral to tourism in Indian country as exhibitions, art markets, and demonstrations can help drive sales and visitations. There are many recognizable public art installations throughout the country and their impact is strong as they connect communities, educate visitors, share history, and bring recognition to an area. As times change, we are seeing an increase in indigenous visibility in various forms of expression. Um, so joining us for today, this webinar discussion is Voltan Eich, founder of Insurgents. Um, Insurgents is an active, is a native owned indigenous brand, business and art collective that advocates for indigenous rights. You will also hear from Lillian Pitt, who is a Pacific Northwest Native American artist whose ancestors lived in and near the Columbia River Gorge. The focus of her work is on creating contemporary fine art pieces that delight today's art lovers and at the same time honor the history and of her people. And last but not least, George Rivera from Pewaukee Pueblo, New Mexico will join the webinar and discuss his sculpting and teaching art for more than 30 years. His work centers primarily on monumental stone and bronze sculpture painting and architectural design. And the driving force behind all of the creations is a Native American public culture. So at this time, I'd like to introduce Voltan Eich. Welcome, Hello. Voltan. Hello, my name is Voltan. Uh, I'm of Maya and Nahua ancestry. Um, and uh, we will feature a video that uh, depicts an image that I painted in Indian Alley in Los Angeles. Do I uh, click on it or you click on it?
Okay, sorry about that. We're trying to figure out why the video is not working. Um, hold on. Okay, Voltan, why don't we just go ahead and start with the just the thought and then we'll come to the video at the end of your presentation. Okay, sounds good. So uh, I, uh, I am, I'm, a mur I'm a muralist, uh, also just a artist in general. And um, this piece here, um, I, it was Photoshop. There's these buildings that are in downtown Los Angeles across from the Staples Center and usually depict uh, basketball players. And one day I was driving through there, growing up in LA, I always saw different uh, images on there. And just the thought came to my head, like what if we were to see huge native chiefs on the side of these buildings, like narrating the, the stories and the history of Los Angeles. Although these three chiefs here are not uh, from Los Angeles, but uh, at that time I was uh, printing t-shirts and posters with these images. So I just Photoshopped it and I put it up on Facebook like uh, in 2013. And I thought, man, that'd be great to have murals like this throughout the country and um, tell the stories of our ancestors. And a year later, uh, I started, I did that mural in Indian Alley, which is of Chief Plenty Coos, who's on the far right. Um, and I was asked to paint it in Indian Alley during a photo uh, exhibit that was gonna take place. Um, put together by Steven Ziegler and Pamela, who uh, is uh, Dene. And after that, things started to move pretty quickly. Um, I, you know, just put it out there in the universe and things, things started happening. So uh, go on to the next one, please, the next slide. So uh, a few years after that, we were hired by Winona LaDuke from Honor the Earth and uh, Michelle LeBeau from ACO, the American Indian Community Housing Organization, to address what had happened at Standing Rock and also the effects of uh, pipelines. So this mural represents a water protector, but it also represents the missing and murdered indigenous women. She's wearing a red jingle dress to represent that and a bandana to uh, also represent the water protectors and the resistance. She's uh, dressed up in what's uh, kind of commonly known as uh, um, Ojibwe floral. Uh, what was really interesting about this piece is that it sparked the conversation about the missing and murdered indigenous women and it was shared throughout not just the United States but throughout the world. There's a lot of footage on it. Um, if you guys you know want to google it and learn more about it. It was very powerful. We uh, started to understand uh, the plight of what has been taking place and also lend a voice to uh, this cause that is very dear to our hearts. Uh, go on to the next one. The next slide. And also during this pandemic, we were working on a documentary with uh, two students from Washington, um, Jonah and Zahn, and they wanted to film the work that we were doing in the community. So we were creating mutual aid work with my partner and several other, with my partner Leah Lewis and several other friends of ours uh, from different organizations. <clears throat> and we uh, used some of our own funds, but also help raise money and feed communities during the pandemic, especially the uh, Navajo Nation that was hit the hardest during this pandemic early on this year. Uh, while we were doing that work, we also put up this huge piece, which was 
um, something that resonated. It was a piece that was created in the past, but it resonated with the gas mask of what's happening uh, today, you know, globally. So we felt that it kind of fit the actual uh, cause of uh, how, how the world is feeling about what's going on. Yeah, go on to the next one, please. And also, since uh, we're called insurgents, uh, we like to represent the struggles that we face as indigenous people, not just here in the United States, but throughout the world. Uh, one of those things is uh, basically taking our lands back, not necessarily through force or revolution, but there's many ways where uh, lands have been returned to indigenous people or uh, you know, people have been given the right to take care of the lands and be the stewards of the land. And I think one of the most important things about that is the way we treat the land as indigenous people. You know, we have a connection to it. We, have to, we know how to take care of it. We've been here for a millennia. And I think it's very important that we continue to do that. We use our work to get the message out and also uh, explain why we feel that it is our right to take care of the land when we live in a society and in the world actually that uh, is very disconnected from that. And for us, the most important thing is the land. And then go on to the next piece. And this uh, final piece here was painted during a mural festival in uh, Samora, Chinchipe, Ecuador. Um, there were several artists, about 20 different artists from different parts of the US, but also of, uh, from Ecuador. And this piece depicts uh, Kirup, who was basically a warrior that fought against Spanish invasion in the Amazon. The Amazon is to us, uh, one of the most pristine uh, and most beautiful places that exists in the world. And there's very, um, there's a lot of very powerful medicine that comes from uh, these communities and from the Amazon. And it's uh, under you know threat right now because of not just COVID for the tribes, but also you know extraction and invasion from neo-colonialism. And I spoke to several of the members um, from that, that tribe up there. And one of the most powerful things that we were able to hear from them was that as youth, they used to walk these streets ashamed of being native with their heads down, you know, getting out of the way of what people call mestizos or uh, people of European descent. And they were ashamed to be who they are. They were called, you know, not just savages, but also they used to call them, you know, Tarzan, men, they used to call men Tarzan uh, to ridicule them and their, their heritage. So when we came to this place, we painted about uh, 12 to 15 different murals with you know, different artists. This was my piece honoring the Shuad people, but also the uh, destruction that's taking place because of extraction for gold and other natural resources. Uh, he's wearing a mask, which is uh, interesting because it also ties into what's happening with the pandemic. And uh, the most important thing was that after speaking to uh, you know, the, the leaders of the community, one of the, the men uh, that I spoke to uh, was, was really impressed and told me that he felt that now he can walk down the streets with uh, his head up because people from different parts of the United States and other parts came to Ecuador to honor his heritage. And I thought that was very powerful. Uh, the background represents the pattern of a jaguar, which is tied into my own ancestry of uh, Maya ancestry, which represents uh, the apex predator to um, defend itself and has uh, basically, uh, you know, the power that we seek as human beings, which is to uh, be able to guide ourselves and see through the darkness, but also be fearless. Do I have a few more minutes or? Uh, Oh, okay. Yeah, let's try and um, see if we can get the video going. Okay. Okay, I'm going to stop the share here really quick. You want me to keep talking or? Sure, keep talking. Oh. So basically, um, the whole uh, idea of being able to do the things that we love to do, I think is very important and powerful, especially if uh, it's in your mind already and you put it out there physically, 
it'll uh, start to evolve and grow. And I think one of the most important things that we have to tell our youth is that go out there and do what you love to do. Um, you know, we've grown up with the idea that artists have to struggle to, to make a living in us. And many of us are, are living proof of that. So I think it's very important that we encourage people to continue to do their work, whatever it is, whether it's music, uh, dance, poetry, or visual arts. I think that our culture would not exist without the artists. And I think it's very important that we encourage artists in our communities because without them, there is no culture. Okay, let me try the video now. Okay. I hope this works. Can you see the video yet? Not yet. Okay, hold on. What's going on here? Can you see it now? Yeah. Okay.
was nice. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Valtan, for that lovely presentation. Some beautiful, beautiful murals with a lot of background story and history. So up next is Lillian Pitt, and I will pull up her PowerPoint presentation. Let me, sorry for the technical, oops, let's see. Technical difficulties here. <laughs> Okay, Lillian, let me pull up your PowerPoint here. Mm -hmm. Hold on. Okay, can you see that, Lillian? Yes. Okay, go ahead. Okay, well, thank you for everyone joining us. And, and, uh, and it's always a treat to share my work. And, uh, and as usual, I do overkill and show too many slides. So we will breeze through those. And then with the... Uh, uh, my intention is to show the young kids that uh, even if you don't have any education, you know, formal education, you can still get these things done. And uh, I have uh, had my, my uh, contemporaries that have been so helpful in um, helping me get these projects done. Okay, next slide. We'll go through these fairly fast, and and um, and usually I work with other people. I worked with Gail Tremblay and Ken McIntosh, and uh, and had fun sand casting them. And there are twenty six of them at the convention center. Next, we're going to zip through these, and so and then again using the she who watches. Uh, because she, she's a petroglyph that overlooked my great-great-grandmother uh, where she lived. And um, so everything I do is trying to honor all my ancestors and, and the heritage that they, they left me to continue with my contemporary um, renditions of, of uh, the petroglyphs and the baskets and such. Okay, next. And the welcome gate, which is bigger and honoring the Chinookan people with their uh, large boats going up and down the river trading since time immemorial. Next. And here's the overlook and uh, working with heavy steel. I'm sure glad I didn't have to lift it. It was half inch steel, and so it was fairly thick. So, okay, next. And in Hillsboro, we did 30 petroglyphs in the, in the basalt columns with Tom Rudd, a Seneca artist who flew in from Pennsylvania to teach me how to carve into the rock. So I've learned many skills that uh, I never thought I'd ever learn. Okay, next. <clears throat> and there's a detail of our petroglyphs. Of course, with my rendition, they look very contemporary because I was just learning as I was doing this. Okay. And helping the students at PSU. Um, Portland State University and the Native American Services Center. So I'm always trying to show youths, young people that they can do all this if they want. You just have to have a lot of persistence. Next. 
and did TriMet at, at uh, a light rail station, did uh, petro contemporary petroglyphs on the stainless steel cladding. And uh, we did a whole bunch of projects for them. It was my first project. And I had excellent contemporaries helping me. You know, Ken McIntosh, Rick Bartow, Gail Tremblay, Elizabeth Woody. We were really a powerful team. And uh, they made me be leader because I was the only local one. And so, okay. You know, so all you have to do is have an okay and get to work. Next. And we did a, a bronze with the feathers at the, at the gable end of TriMet and with the salmon on the, on the ends as well. And the whole project was about honoring salmon. Next. And here's honoring salmon, steel and uh, bronze and, uh, and some bronze sheet where uh, Gail taught a poetry class and Rick taught a drawing class. And um, it was just so much fun for the kids that went to school behind there. We did a seven week program as well as doing the artwork. And so I always try to involve education in it. Okay, next. And here's my She Who Watches. And the poems were really cute. They were about the animals that they saw around the neighborhood. So there were a lot about crows and squirrels and frogs and and one did a, rat, a poem about a rat. And so you never knew what you were going to be involved in. And Gail was really a wonderful poet to work with these kids. Okay, next. The River Guardian, working with Michael and Sarah Lynn Hildy and um, their dear friends who who wanted to do the best job they could. And we have this overlooking the Willamette River and uh, it's called the River Guardian. And so there's a uh, glass, uh, glass mask overlooking the water and, uh, and overlooking the communities that live behind, behind her. Next. And this one was a real fun one. This was at the health and wellness at Chamawa. And those are truck and car reflectors that we made into designs. And Michael was real good with the, with the CAD machine and uh, our computer. And so we came up with these old beaded designs and uh, put them on, on the building and people just loved them that went into the building. Next. And the environmental group wanted us to do uh, a recycling honoring and we did a Coca-Cola shape for the between the legs and then when we first traded in our cans and and bottles, we just got five cents. And so that was really fun doing that for the city of Salem. And there's glass and, and aluminum and, uh, and on, on concrete. Next. And then in the Dalles, at the readiness center, that's where the, the uh, Coast Guard, Oregon Coast Guard has their offices. And uh, there was a big space that I thought needed something. And so, so you never know when, when you're going to find something that is not usual for what you do, but the space talks to you. And so we went with that and, and again, my petroglyphs and honoring the salmon and 
the army stars and the petroglyph stars. So it's joining the two cultures. Next. And then working with Juno and, and uh, with inlaid uh, glass inserts and, and uh, he did sandblasting to these columns. And then in the center, we have uh, the sacred water area. And so that just fills with the rainwater. And you can see the, uh, uh, the mural up there, um, Toma Villa did that honoring our elder. And so it, it's really nice because this is in the Native American Youth and Family Association. And so, and it's housing for 51 families. And so we're involved in civic work as well. And so the next one. And the final one is the watcher. This is a private commission and, uh, and it's, it's uh, over, it's got her back to the uh, Columbia River. And so she's watching the people walk by. And so I think that's my final one. I sure appreciate being here. Yes. Well, thank you, Lillian. That was a lovely, lovely presentation. So we do have George Rivera, and he's actually not on the Zoom link just yet. So um, Lillian, did you want to talk a little bit more? Um, yeah. Um, talking about getting into public work is, um, is sometimes a, you never know what you're going to be involved in because my work is not specifically one thing. And um, I have done other things like uh, making prints and changing them into uh, sound barriers and things like that. And so, so for the kids, you just can't say no to anything because every time you do something, it's a, it's a chance to learn and a chance to honor your ancestors in the land. And, um, and that's so important to me is to continue, continue. And uh, as, as I'm getting older, you know, it's more important to me and to maintain the course and be ever vigilant as to what I'm saying and, and uh, being careful not to insult my elders with, with the contemporary work. And so it's, it's, I've been an artist for 40 years and uh, just graduated with an AA from Mount Hood Community College. I was going to be a social worker until I met uh, R.C. Gorman, the Navajo artist, and he bought my first work. And I thought I'd give it, uh, give it a year. And if, it, if nothing happened, I'd go back to college and be a social worker. Well, that's been 40 years ago. So R.C. Gorman was very helpful in um, getting me started with his galleries throughout the U.S. And I didn't know squat about being an artist. And so, and, and it ends up like this. And so I'm very grateful to him. And, uh, to all my other contemporaries who are so helpful to me. Thank you. Okay, so George is still not on. Um, so what we're gonna go ahead and do is, um, there's a question. Answer some questions here. Let's see, we're going to the chat box. Um, so Lindsay Keeley is asking, I was curious about how Lillian has been able to find all of these opportunities for public art. 
do organizations approach you or do you apply to calls for artists? Uh, both. And um, I applied and uh, usually had, uh, uh, had help from uh, good writers, you know, people to help me write the proposals and, and my focus and, and, uh, and knowing working with excellent people and knowing the timeline to, to submit all, all these proposals. And as I, as I got older and more involved, people started asking me to do something. And if I didn't want to do it, then I would know who to do it, you know, and that's where I've mentored younger artists that are skilled and educated. And so it goes both, well, there's three different ways. And so it, it's, all, it's, it's all been a, um, a unknown. And, uh, you know, so I can't plan my year because I don't know what's coming up. So we have another question. Um, what tips would you give artists to get commissions? Have excellent photographs and be clear about what it is you're doing with your focus and, um, and have a good resume and, um, and then have people help you, you know, it's, uh, having good photography is really important and uh, making your products with uh, you know just making sure everything is professional and by professional I mean just clean and uh, and then being on time with your deadlines and uh, and then just uh, like R.C. Gorman, when he, when he was going to college in, uh, in San Francisco, he got these license plate things and put on the back of the license plate, who is R.C. Gorman? You know, now that is so clever. So you could do, <laughs> you could do that if you wanted, you know, and so, but it's really fun. You can get as creative as you want. Thank you, Lillian. So now we have George Rivera on. George, are you there? You might be on mute. Uh, I'm, I'm good now. Can you hear me? Okay, yes. So here's your first slide. Go ahead. Okay, yeah, that's me. <laughs> well, uh, hello to everybody. And um, I know we're going to talk about the... Uh, uh, effect of public arts in New Mexico and, uh, and throughout Indian country. And um, that's what I have focused on for uh, many years was uh, promoting the arts and the artists and continuing to respect and represent the culture of the Native Americans. And as any other culture, art is one of the main um, venues that we have to uh, talk about ourselves, represent ourselves, teach our youth about who we are, and then move forward into the future. And so I'm 100% um, behind IANTA and all of the, the programs that are being developed to teach art and to promote uh, Native American tourism. And so each tribe has the ability and each tribal member has the ability to um, document who they are, represent themselves, and uh, as I said, to teach the future about um, Native American identity and spiritualism and, and, the, and the belief that it should continue. So um, 
did did you have any questions for me? I know I opened right away with talking. Did you have any questions about for me? So we're going through your PowerPoint slides. George, can you uh -huh. see that? Maybe you can talk um, about that for about five I'm minutes. I'm on my... I'm on my phone, but um, yeah, you're probably looking like at Buffalo Thunder Resort. Yes. You're looking at some, some monumental sculptures that I did. Um, so I, I uh, initially started uh, here in Santa Fe at Santa Fe High School. Then I went to the Institute of American Indian Arts, and then I went to California College of Arts and Crafts, and I went to La Cosse School of Arts in Provence, uh, and studied and traveled and saw the world and came back home and said, you know, we, we need to um, up our game in terms of preserving culture. And we need to develop a center, which I did. I developed a Poe Cultural Center, which is uh, teaching and also a museum for Native American arts. And um, that has been like the model for uh, not just other tribes to be able to um, look at and learn from what we did, but it was the model for all of our business development. So as um, uh, I was a tribal leader for 22 years, and as I did uh, business development, I incorporated all of what I had learned about um, developing the cultural center and even physically made the businesses look like uh, Pueblo architecture. So I developed the largest resort in the state and it's probably the largest Pueblo uh, architectural looking building in the state. It's over 400,000 square feet and a collection of over 300 artists. Initially, I'm not sure where it's at now, but oh, initially I, I bought um, collected work for the resort over 300 artists and incorporated um, designs and patterns and themes uh, related to Native American art from the floor to ceiling. So when you go to Buffalo Thunder, you see the floors, uh, the walls and the ceilings are all taken into consideration. The lighting, the bed sheets, the headboards, the furniture, it's all based on uh, Native American patterns and designs done by uh, a team that I put together of artists. So it can be done and it needs to be done each, each um, tribe that decides to go into business if they want to um, you know, be proud and, and carry on their, their own identity. It takes a little bit of work, but shouldn't cost too much more on their overall budget to incorporate their own um, uh, identity through the arts. And, and as a result, that becomes the theme for people who are coming to um, their tribe for uh, tourism sake, let's say. Um, that's what they're coming for. They're coming to see who are these people and what, what is their identity. And, and, and they want to make that connection. And, and so the artists are the ones who help make that connection for, for the tourism factor of uh, um, economic development and the arts. We'll take a break there. Okay, so we are on your lightning boy slide, George. Yeah, uh, the sculpture of my son, Valentino, um, he was an amazing uh, boy who unfortunately uh, passed, but I, um, in my pain and suffering of losing him, I went to art again for healing and I sculpted him life size. And that sits in front of the Museum of Indian Arts and Culture at the front door. And it is uh, uh, one of the first sculptures of any Pueblo person uh, to be put in Santa Fe. And um, it's appropriate that it's a young child and it inspires so many other youth when they see that and they read the story about him. 
uh, to know who he was and and how um, he he lived his life. I mean, he was a young boy who was international uh, by age five. He was out there dancing all over um, this country and in Western Europe and just saw no limits. And so um, I needed to um, honor him and I still do. And, and I did it in the form of sculpture. And then we uh, also have a foundation where we uh, teach uh, the youth hoop dancing. And, you know, this is, it's, it's, a, it's a very um, important dance to learn. And, and it's a very important um, uh, thing to teach the youth. So in, in what we do, in teaching them is we build this extra confidence to them that they don't even know that they have until they get into our group and our organization. And then they all of a sudden realize that um, their culture is so important and their dance is so important and, and they can do this anywhere. And they are uh, proud at, that they can make um, make their family and, and make their, their community proud of themselves as well as being able to show anywhere in public how amazing they are. So what I love that confidence building. I'll take a break there. Okay, <laughs> thank you for that, George. Um, so right now, Let's go back to the Q&As. Anybody has any questions for our artists? So this question is for Voltan. Do your murals include community participation? Um, yes. Um, a lot of the times, actually, we have the community get involved. Um, you know, one of the most notable was the mural in uh, Duluth, where I probably lost track of how many people wanted to just even paint a brick if they could. Uh, probably about 50 to 60 people came by and, you know, wanted to help in some way. Um, and I think it was important for us to um, have that happen, especially because it's in their community and it represents them and their history. So, it's, it's vital that the community gets involved in, in one way or another. Um, of course, as artists, our, our egos are like, oh no, like the, line, the lines are gonna be crooked or whatever, but we went back and fixed a couple of things, but it was okay. And it allowed us to become community as well with that community. So uh, we developed friendships from that. Uh, and I think it's very important that uh, the community is there because uh, we drive on, on building bridges you know, throughout Indian country. And that's one of the ways to do it. Okay, we have another question. Is there a lot of competition for public art applications? Do Native American artists compete against other Native artists or are they usually open to all? Um, well, I'll, I'll be quick and then, you know, the other artists can answer, but Sure. Um, it all depends what you want to do. I think that there's not enough native muralists, I'll be honest with you. And I think there needs to be more. Uh, the world is huge. Um, and I don't think you necessarily have to put yourself in a category where you have to compete against other native muralists. I think you just go out there and do what you do, like do the art that you do. I mean, I ended up, you know, in, in Ecuador and, and in Germany and, and in Dubai doing like political native art. Um, there was a couple of native people there, but it doesn't necessarily have to be uh, competitive. You know what I mean? Uh, I think it's most important that you're able to thrive with native art throughout the world, anywhere. You can go anywhere and do native art. It doesn't have to be in the community. It could, and I think it's beautiful when it is, but it's also amazing when you go to other indigenous communities and build a uh, community there. Lillian, did you want to answer that question as well? Um, yeah, you know, um, I, I've been involved in both 
uh, requesting native artists and uh, for the general public. And so it's, uh, it's always a little uncomfortable for me because I've been doing public art for about, oh, only about 12 years. But because of, of being a professional and, and saying what I'm going, doing what I say I'm going to do, you know, I feel like it has uh, taught the other artists what what to do, and and so in teaching the other artists, I do get something back, and uh, then we're we're again an, uh, another community of artists, and with the the other um, competitions, it's uh, it's always you never know. So it, it just depends on your focus. And I don't try to change my focus of representing the native people at all. And George, did you wanna answer that question? Oh, sure. And, and it's probably gonna be the, the last question I can uh, take, I gotta get off the phone here. I'm in, a, in another meeting, but I, I want to say thank you for having me. And um, my uh, website is uh, georgeriverastudio.com. People want to look at my work, but yes, I do uh, go out there and compete. Um, but primarily I try to stay focused on where I have the best opportunity to make an important piece for a tribe uh, or a community. I've done some pieces for the city of Santa Fe and then I've done some other really big pieces for uh, tribes in California and New Mexico. And, um, you know, it, it, what's important is to, to know your, um, to know what it is, uh, to know what it takes to get uh, a public work of art out there. And so I think, you know, knowing what your costs are and making sure that your budget and your, um, your deliverables uh, are gonna be what you plan it to be and make sure that you don't cut yourself short. A lot of people always think that art is negotiable and that it should be a, a good price. And, um, you know, we, as an artist, you have to make a living. And, and if you're good and you wanna um, put your, uh, work out there you need to make sure that you survive the next day so don't sell yourself short uh, put in all your expenses you know you got a lot of issues to deal with um, making the original design um, I, I actually have to insure all of my pieces uh, from beginning to deliverable uh, till I uh, put them in place and and I have to travel and so um, there's a lot of things to consider. So when you're, when you're putting in this, you know, your, your bid or your request, um, uh, there's a business side of it that you have to pay attention to. And then there's also the, you know, the most important part, which is, uh, how do you make your work of art, um, best represent the community that you're putting it in and, or the statement that you're making, and so with that comes research and uh, reading, interviews. Um, I, I do a lot of background work to, before I put out a product for uh, any customer. And so I'll read their books, I'll look them up on the internet, find out who they are, interview them personally. And then, and then that makes the sculpture so much more uh, a part of them uh, knowing um, that kind of information, but you always have to have that business side to know that um, uh, you're going to be able to pull it off and um, you know feed your kids and 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 uh, be able to do your next piece. You don't want you don't want to break yourself, so make sure you don't uh, undervalue your work. Thank you for that, George. Okay, we're gonna stop all questions here. Um, we're about at the end of our webinar. I do wanna mention, um, if you haven't become an IANTA member, 
do so. And at this time, if you do become an IENTA member, you will receive one of these thumb drives, the IENTA's proprietary jingle dress thumb drive, also designed by Insurgents. And it's very cute. Um, let's see, I'm going to stop sharing. I'm going to show you what it looks like. Can you see? <laughs> yeah, so oh, cool. yeah. And on the back, it has Ayanta. But yeah, I do want to thank you all for joining us today. Thanking uh, Lillian, Voltan, George, who came in at the end there. Um, and sorry for the technical difficulties. Um, we're still trying to learn this Zoom program. We're not pros just yet, but hopefully by next month we will be. Um, so thank you for bearing with us. I um, also just want to let you know that um, this recording of the webinar will be available to you um, on YouTube and on our website. We will email those links to you. Everyone who's registered for the webinar today, you will be emailed this recording. If you haven't signed up for our newsletter, please do so at ianta.org and you will receive um, information from IANTA every month on the 15th um, about our programming, about our um, upcoming events, um, especially for the American Indian Tourism Conference coming up in October. Please look out for the information on that, as well as our webinar series. We will be having um, IANTA webinar series every month until September and also um, our ANZA series, which will be up until April. And those are free. All of our webinars are currently free. So please do sign up for those um, when you have availability. Any questions that we haven't answered, I will send those questions to our um, guest speakers today and they can contact you via email and answer those questions, but we will get those questions answered. Okay, I think time's up. So thank you all again for joining us today. And we thank you for your support with IANTA. Please do check out our resource page again. We do have our agritourism resource page up and available. And at this time, we will go ahead and end the webinar. Thank you all. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you.